Hey everybody, Payments Professor Kevin Olson here and I wanna welcome everybody to the Payments Podium. Today, we got a treasure for all of you. And when I say treasury, treasure, it's really treasury talent because I've got Simon Lynch from Treasury Talent and he's joining us and we're gonna be talking a little bit about, well, what's it mean to be treasury talent? What is treasury talent? Totally different things right there. And how you can be, well, payments and treasury talent yourself. So Simon, I'd like to welcome you to the podcast. Kevin, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here and quite a weird feeling. I'm normally the guy asking the question, so I'm looking forward to uh, to being asked today. All right, well, we're flipping the script a little bit. Well, on the Payments Podium, one of the things we do, Simon, is we talk about the past, we talk about the present, and we talk about the possibilities. Now, I know you are working in Treasury Talent and you have a company called Treasury Talent, but for my listeners, could, could you explain to them who you are and what you do? Absolutely, Kevin. So um, I run a recruitment business that's focused purely on treasury. So um, we basically recruit anyone that would be in a treasury team, um, which by default would, would include the, the payment side of things, obviously being a big part of, of treasury. Um, I've done, I set that business up in 2012, but I've been in financial recruitment for 20 plus years myself. Um, I also have um, a podcast. Um, so like yourself, as I mentioned, I'm normally the one asking the questions. Um, we really talk anything um, to do with treasury. Um, mainly, I, I interview CFOs and treasurers, um, and we talk more about the softer side of things. So I'm not a actual practitioner myself. Um, so anything that got in, is involved in the recruitment process is what I'm good at. Um, and so that's really what we talk about. So it, for the listeners out there, think career development, think management, leadership, networking, mentors, career mapping, um, interview advice, you know, uh, education and development, soft skills, that, that type of stuff is essentially the angle that we take. Um, I'm really specific on getting um, senior people who have been there before. So um, it, it's the aspirational type people that a lot of my listeners want to be like um, and working for companies that these people aspire to work for as well. So um, very much, you know, if you look at my, at my guest list, um, they're all people that most people would love to have their job. Um, and that's very much what I focus on. And, and as a business, we're, we're focused across the US, we're Asia, we're Australia, and we're the Middle East. Okay, how does somebody get a start in doing that? You said you've done it for a couple of decades. And that, that's an incredible niche right there, too, to work with treasury people finding those skilled people, getting them to those jobs, getting the, like you said, getting people into the job that other people would want. That's uh, huge. How did you get a start in doing that? I mean, what led you down that road? Uh, purely by accident, if I'm totally honest, Kevin. So I started life um, in, I did an accounting uh, business degree um, because all my friends were, and that's where the jobs were. So I started at, with KPMG. I was probably the world's worst auditor. Um, I remember um, my partner at the time, uh, as in my audit partner, my boss, um, saying to me, Simon, you're brilliant with the clients. They all love you. You really get a good insight into their business and you get so much information, but you really need to focus on technical accounting. You, you know, you're really, you're really letting yourself down with your technical skills. And that, that was the day that I knew that that, that was not the place for me. Um, I actually ended up uh, going to a, a large international recruitment company and saying exactly that, like, this is what I'm good at. I don't really know what I wanted to do. And they said, well, why don't you come and work in recruitment? And I had no idea what recruitment was. That was, you know, I don't know, probably 22 years ago now. Um, even my parents didn't know what recruitment was when I tried to explain it to them. So by default, um, you know, but that, that business led me to work globally, which is, you know, part of what I wanted to do um, when I was uh, going even into accounting. Um, and then Treasury, I, I came across Treasury really again by default in that working for a large multinational, we were really good at core accounting roles. When we got specialist roles, be it Treasury or tax or audit or corporate finance, um, those type of roles, we were never that good at because it was more of a niche. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I recognised that in order to be relevant and to, to own something, you needed to go into one of those rather than be sort of a race for the bottom um, recruiting general roles. So at the time, there was no one in Australia uh, who recruited treasury roles. There literally was not one person focused on it. And so I saw that opportunity and seized it. And that was uh, in 2012. That's then led me really to my clients in Australia wanted me to recruit in Asia. Um, I set up a business in Asia on the back of that. And then 
mainly my Singapore clients, actually half of them were US multinationals. And they said there was no one really doing what I do in America. So we set up the business in America uh, just over 12 months ago. Okay, let's clarify just for the listeners, just to make sure they understand. You're actually in Australia as we're doing this podcast. I'm here in Tampa, you're in Australia, and technology makes all this stuff possible. You started off in, you know, in, in, in the world of recruitment when it was, what is recruiting? And, and I'm with you. I remember when I first heard, you mean there's somebody who'll help me get a job? What? That, okay. And uh, I thought that was amazing. But let's go ahead and clarify for them that, yeah, you're coming here internationally and you're able to help people internationally when it comes to locating jobs in treasury and, and being able to find, you know, if you need somebody, hey, I can help you find somebody. Or if you're somebody looking for something, you can help them find that something. Is that, that correct? Absolutely, Kevin. Yeah. So I, I live in Sydney. Um, I, I do have people on the ground, though, in other locations in order to, to actually do the, the recruitment piece. So um, from my perspective, I guess I'm the face of the business and, and I do um, a lot of this, like the social media, the, the branding, that side um, and my podcast, obviously. Um, but then when it comes to the actual physical recruitment, um, I do need people just from a time zone perspective. You actually don't need people on the ground. So my business is actually mm -hmm. geographically agnostic and we all work from home. Um, so in a way, the pandemic has actually played into our hands because people have become used to this, you know, doing Zoom as their normal now. It was the normal for us before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't normal for, for other people. So we were still doing a lot more in, uh, you know, face to face. So as an example, in 2020, I probably would have done uh, at least eight, if not 10 trips to the US. Um, the last trip I did to the US was actually uh, in February. Um, and I've, we've been able to, to grow the business and, and do everything else remotely because the pandemic has allowed video conferencing to work. Um, I'm also a big believer that you know, recruitment is, is about knowing people. It's about networking. And I'll talk about networking later. Right. Networking is, is not, um, it's about business, uh, sorry, developing relationships in my view. So um, you can develop relationships remotely. You can develop relationships in person. And uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like the pandemic has allowed us to do these sort of things remotely. And as you can see, all companies right now are recruiting remotely. So it's absolutely possible. Well, OK, can I ask you a question? Because you, you said you were the world's worst auditor. Now, and, and I, I bring that up because I know when I first got into some jobs in my past, I didn't like them and I wasn't good at them. But I was able to discover where I was good at and what I was good at. What would you say to somebody, because you also made the comment, you know, be relevant and own something. What would you say to somebody who's in a job that they're not really that good at, but what would you tell them to do to be able to find where they would be good, where they would be a good fit, where they could be relevant and they could own something? So, I mean, look, I, I think being the world's worst auditor was fabulous for me because it made me realize what I was good at. And that's that was relating to people. So. Going the, the parts of my job that I was good at um, were very evident and, and all came back in my reviews. Uh, the parts that I wasn't good at were also really, really obvious. Um, and for me, that was the technical part of it. So um, for me, I just went to, uh, you know, I spoke to people to understand, okay, this is what I'm good at. What would you recommend? And that was when recruitment came to me. So in the second part of your question there, what would I say to other people who are in a job that they don't think they're good at is, Think about the things that you are good at and then go and talk to people and understand what else is in the market that that would be in the realm that you're good at. Go to your strengths rather than go to your weaknesses. And if I had stayed in auditing, I, I literally probably would have got fired because I wasn't technically strong enough. Um, I would have been great at winning business for that company, you know, for the, for the firm. And I'm sure, well, I, I wouldn't have made it to partner because I wasn't technically strong enough. Um, I had all the skill sets and attributes to be able to do the sales part of it. So I went to a sales related role, which is how I ended up in recruitment. Hey, and and you, you said something huge that is I, I find important. And that's go to talk to people and find out what your strengths are uh, in, in coaching. And, and I think coaching has got some similarities to recruiting, too. But in coaching, I tell people what I would like you to do is go talk to the people you respect Go talk to the people whose job you would like to have and whose opinion matters to you and ask them to tell you what your strengths are if you don't know what your strengths are. Are there other ways that people can identify what their strengths are and how to play to them? Look, I think 
generally speaking, you, you, you will know what your strengths are. But if you're not mm -hmm. sure yet, go and speak to people. Like, speak to your work colleagues. Um, speak to your boss. Um, you know, have a candid conversation with, with these people. They will tell you, you know, like people want to help. Um, you know, no one, no one, I, I don't think anyone out there really wants people to, to fail. Um, and if you're not good at what you want, they're, they're probably going to encourage you to go and do something that you're, you're better at anyway. So, yeah, go to people that are close to you, um, the people that you work with, and, and ask them for a candid conversation to understand what it is. And then try and speak to as many people as you can about what they think you would be good at. What are the roles that you can do? Because there's a lot of jobs out there that people don't even know what they are. I got to agree with you on that as well. Uh, go find out. I mean, it's it's a journey that you just, I feel like you never stop doing. Um, let's go to that networking though, because I'm a big person on networking. I've always said, you know, back when we went to in-person events, uh, uh, anybody who was on my staff, anybody on my team, that you never miss an opportunity to meet more people. If you're at a conference, you go to every reception that you can and you just meet people. Say hi, tell them, hey, this is what I do. What do you do? Can you tell me more about your job? Be, you know, I also tell them, don't try to be interesting. Always try to be interested in other people so that you can learn more about them. And, and it's huge. Now, what, what can we do, though? Because you said developing relationships remotely. And I know for some people that has been a true challenge. What advice would you tell people who are needing to still develop relationships, looking to develop those relationships, what they can do to be networking, but still doing it, you know, of course, at our safe distance? Look, I, I mean, I, I will answer that, Kevin, by sort of saying, what have I done during the pandemic? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I network or, you know, develop relationships for a living. Um, therefore, the pandemic has definitely thrown a curveball in that it makes it a lot harder to do that. But at the same time, it makes it easier. Uh, so doing be, being able to do a Zoom call or whatever platform you want to be on is actually quite easy. So I make a bit of a joke and, and say uh, to people like, do you want to catch up for a virtual coffee? You know, we don't actually have a virtual coffee, but it's a way of saying, do you want to have a chat? Do you want to get on the phone? And, you know, do you want to have a call? And if you actually think about it, and look at my business as an example, um, the more people I meet, the better, because I want, to, I want to build relationships. I can now have, in a day, you can probably have eight back-to-back -back meetings, probably have more than that if I'm honest, but I could probably do eight back-to-back -back meetings of half an hour. Um, that will be half an hour, hang up on the Zoom call, the other person is there, ready to go. So that's four hours of work that I can get for eight, for eight meetings. In the past, if we were doing face-to-face -face meetings, I would have had to have gone to a coffee shop or mm -hmm. met them somewhere. You've got travel time in between. There's no way you can do back-to-back -back meetings on a half hour slot face-to-face. -face. So in a way, it's actually made life easier being able to do things virtually. You've just got to find an angle to talk to people. And the reality of that is people are always open to having a chat. You know, they are. Do you want to have a chat? Do you want to have a coffee? Whatever your angle is, there's always an angle that you can take to be able to get someone there. And they might not accept first time, but you've just got to keep asking. That's that's what networking and building relationships is about. Even in face-to-face, -face, you might go and talk to someone and they're busy talking to someone else and you don't really get the five minutes that you want. So it, it's just doing the same things across, uh, across a different medium in my view. Well, and let, let me share with the listeners how you and I met. You and I met virtually. We met via LinkedIn because of a mutual acquaintance. And I know um, that mutual acquaintance I met at a conference virtually that took place this year. I ended up being on a panel with them. And then after the, the panel was over, I made a point to go talk to everybody on the panel individually. And then by doing that, suddenly my name came up in a conversation when you were talking with that same person and suddenly we're connected. You reached out and said, hey, would you like to talk? And my response for everybody who's listening, when somebody says, hey, would you like to talk? The answer is yes. It's always yes, always find the time to have the conversation. Now, when you have that conversation like you and I did, what, what would you tell people to say? I, mean, I could tell them exactly the model of what our conversation went like, but I'd like to hear what would you tell them to say when you're going in what, you know, people say it's like talking to a stranger. And I, I go in with the attitude of it's like talking to a new friend I've just met or haven't met yet. Well, I mean, the best example is probably uh, how we connected, Kevin. I think I didn't really know much about your background. Obviously, before we got on the phone, I did some research and realized you were the payments professor um, and had a look at a little bit about your background. But even, even from your LinkedIn profile, 
I didn't know it as much as I did after the half hour or 40 minutes, whatever it was that we spoke. And I think we just both went into that conversation. I know I did asking, what can I do to help you? You know, what do you do? How can I help you? Um, I've been referred through to you by this person and this person. So I thought we should connect. Um, but, you know, I, I really had no idea where that conversation was going. I wasn't going into it thinking to myself, I want to get X out of Kevin. Um, and I think that's the difference between networking as a word and building relationships. So, you know, right. if you go into networking and if you talk to people, um, you know, you've got a network. I think people think, okay, I've got to go and talk to people who will get me a job. They're going to get me my next job. That, that's what they kind of associate networking with. Um, my view of that is, and like our conversation, I go into it thinking, okay, how can I build a relationship with this person? And what can I do to help? And by chance, there, there may be something that comes back to me on the back of that. But if someone's recommending I should talk to you, Kevin, there's generally going to be some synergies there between what you do and what I do. Um, but I think, you know, like you, you made the comment about going, uh, going along to conferences in person and be interested rather than interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a, really, that's a really valid point is, you know, if you can go and think, okay, how will I help these other people? Um, mm -hmm. Not what am I going to get out of it? Then you will genuinely form a relationship and then it may not be that right there and then, but in time, something will come of that. And, you know, we're on a podcast today on the back of the fact that we reached out and had that conversation in the first place with no, you know, with no real um, agenda that, that needed to be there. And that, I think that's the other really key point as well, Kevin, is building relationships is a long game. If you're going into it to think to yourself, okay, I've just lost my job. I need to go and network. Oh, can you say that again? Can you, can you take that over from I just lost my job because it, internet just went on me. No worries. Great. So if you're thinking to yourself, I've just lost my job, I need to go and network, you've actually really missed the boat because the relationships you needed to build should have been happening a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, rather than the, when you need them. Um, and that's the difference between th your thinking. It needs to be networking is building relationships, not networking is, is going out and getting your next job. And if, if you take that long-term view um, and try and think, I, my view is pay it forward. Think, what mm -hmm. can I do to help other people? And then by and large, stuff starts to come back to you. Well, you know what, Simon, I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to earmark this podcast and in six months, maybe even a year, come back to it and say, hey, folks, if you remember, Simon and I, we talked about six months or a year ago, and this is what came out of it. We went into it not really knowing, but in, you know, the the oh, what, what's the word, the, the effervescence of, hey, what can I do to help you? You know, how can we help each other? And as a couple of gentlemen who got a lot of gray in their beards here, those of you who are new out there and you're looking for what you can do, let me tell you, this is what we've both done to have successful careers is you just build the relationship with no expectations and you'll be surprised what comes out of it. Now, here I am talking about those six months or a year from now, looking at that future and, and the possibilities that could come. So what would you tell people, though, who are looking for those future possibilities, looking for, you know, beyond the networking, beyond finding their strengths and building their skills, or maybe it is building their skills. What should they start doing now for the future them? What should they do start doing now for that future job, that future position that they want to have? What would your advice be to them? So the other thing I think that's really important, Kevin, is um, career mapping. And when I say career mapping, um, the beauty of my job, and I, I do love saying this, but I actually don't really make decisions in my job. I just give people opportunities and options. Um, so be it when I'm working with a client, I, I don't choose the person that they recruit into that job. I just give them five options or however many options that they want. Likewise, when someone's, when someone's looking for their next job, I don't tell them the job they have to take. I just give them, these are the options out there and these are the benefits or these are the, the, the downsides of, of each role. Um, so to me, I think the really important thing is to map out your career. There's not one right answer for the way that your career should play out. And that's actually something that comes through a lot. And part of the, the, the beauty of my podcast is I talk to lots of treasurers. They're all people that have got to the top job that, that a lot of people aspire to. And the, the thing that comes out the most in that, Kevin, is they've all done it differently. They've all done it their way. And there's not right, there's not one right way to get there. So for the listeners out there, what you really need to do is start to map out what you want your career to look like 
and then you can start to understand what your next move is. Um, I'm a big believer in a niche like treasury that you can move every couple of years. You know, every two to three years, if you're not getting the right role internally, you move externally and get the role externally. And, you know, being treasury being the niche that it is, there's always a blocker. So if you're the assistant treasurer and the treasurer is not going anywhere, he's been in his job for a year, the chances are in a year from now, you're still not going to get that job. So you're going to have to move externally to get that treasurer job that you covered. Um, likewise, you know, if you go to the, if you're the analyst and there's two managers above you and both of those are not going anywhere, then you're going to have to move somewhere else to get that, that next level of role. So you just need to understand what you want your career to become to know what role is going to be next. And really it's hard to know without talking to lots of people, understand, okay, this is where I want to go. Um, and that's where people like, like us at Treasury Talent come in. We can tell you, okay, these are your career options. These are the things you need to tick off. So if we're talking specifically Treasury, you know, you need to do debt capital markets. You need to do cash management. You need to do Treasury management systems. Um, you need to do FX and, and international. Um, you need to work at smaller hands-on companies. You need to work at massive conglomerates where you're just a, a really small part of the, um, of the very big wheel. All of that rich tapestry of experience allows you to get to the treasurer role and be successful. So you've just got to understand your own wants and desires and then work out what's the path for me to get there and set about doing it. You know, I, I definitely see a lot of people who become complacent. Again, my view is yes. move, move more quickly, get there quick. You know, it's, everyone always says to me, how do I fast track my career, Simon? Well, you fast track your career by knowing where you want to get to, and then going about making the moves to get there. Now on the career mapping, and, and, and just in case anybody out there is going, well, of course he's gonna say do this because he's got a business that do this. Let me say, I support this right away. And, and I wanna hear your opinion, but on the career mapping, on figuring out what you wanna do, is that something somebody does alone? Or is that something that somebody does with someone else? And I ask that because again, in the coaching I've done in over the years, in the leadership roles that you've mentioned, in the mentoring that I've done with other people, that is something that I found when I was on the flip side asking, hey, how do I get help? When I was getting coached, when I was getting mentored, by having somebody else tell me the things I don't see, tell me the things that they did to be successful that I needed to do, it really accelerated my career. So is this something that, you know, you would tell people don't do it on your own, get with somebody, work with somebody to be able to be even more successful? 100%, Kevin. I, I think that we, we don't know what we don't know. So, you know, in my world, if you're a treasury analyst, a lot of them don't really know what their options are. You know, all, all that they'll look at is the person above them is the manager. So they'll say to us, oh, I wanna be a treasury manager. And then when you actually say to them, okay, well, why do you wanna be a treasury manager? they don't really know why and they don't know how to get to where they want to be. So you, you need to talk to people. Um, absolutely. You know, you can go to specialists in your area. You can have mentors. You can go to coaches, as you say. Um, you know, we at Treasury Talent really try to get, put as much information as we can out there. And that's really been our, our niche is to, to put information out there for the Treasury community. To, so there's more information out there so people know what their options are. And if I'm honest, Kevin, that's the reason the podcast, my podcast is so successful mm -hmm. is because it tells people's career journeys. And I can't remember how many we've got now. I want to say 165. There's 165 different examples out there of what people did to get where they are. And the feedback I get all the time from particularly juniors is, oh my goodness, I didn't realize there were so many options. I didn't realize I could do this. Um, and so going out there and, and chatting to as many people and getting as much information as you can is important for you to be able to map out what you want, because you as an individual are going to be different from me. You know, I mean, not that I'm Absolutely. a treasurer, but, you know, I could have two, two people sitting at the same level and the career paths they will take will be fundamentally different to end up at the same role. So I, I think information is key and talking to people is the only way you're going to get information. All right. Well, Simon, this has been incredible. And before I get your closing comment, I do want to tell everybody, it's not just treasury. You can be in operations, you can be in compliance, you can be working for a financial institution, for a business, for a third party service provider, maybe even the government. All of this advice 
it, it will work for you. And you know, the things that we heard, you know, networking still possible virtually, have the virtual coffee, like Sam, Simon said. Um, you can be relevant and own things. And that's where you're gonna be able to then work and find your strengths. Work with other people though, definitely work with other people and be willing to ask, what can I do to help you? That I thought was huge in itself. So as, as we're closing out the payments podium today, Simon, I would love to hear your closing comments on what people should be doing and uh, where they could be looking for the future of, well, treasury talent. I, I mean, my, the, the only thing I would say that I would love your listeners to take away from today is the essence of paying it forward. Um, and if you can go into everything else we've spoken about, if you, if you go into it thinking, how can I help other people? Um, and put yourself out there and build relationships or network, then the rest of it will look after itself because you're, you're dedicating the time to network and to meet other people and you're doing what you can to help them. The rest of it will look after itself for you in my view. And I only say that with 20 years of experience as a, as a, a relationship builder and a networker, I can say fundamentally it, it does work. I got to agree. I, in fact, I don't think I could agree more with your closing comment. Everybody get out there and pay it forward. Simon, thank you so much for being on the Payments Podium. I am the Payments Professor, Kevin Olson. And any of you out there listening that if you know somebody who maybe needs to be on the Payments Podium, send me an email, kevin at paymentsprofessor.com. Or maybe there's a topic you'd like to have discussed. Also, send me an email, kevin at paymentsprofessor.com. This is the Payments Podium. Again, Simon, thank you for being on the show. And I got to say class dismissed.